welcome to the Horses Equine Innovators Podcast, sponsored by Zoetis. I'm your host, Stephanie Church, Editor-in-Chief at The Horse. Every day, researchers at universities and other institutions around the world are investigating new ways to care for and understand our horses in the horse industry. In this podcast series, we talk to those innovators to learn more about their work. First today, a message from our sponsor. Core EQ Innovator from Zoetis is the first and only vaccine to protect against all five potentially fatal core equine diseases in a single injection. Rabies, tetanus, West Nile virus, plus Eastern and Western encephalomyelitis. Talk to your veterinarian today to schedule your horse's vaccination with Core EQ Innovator. And now for today's conversation. As horse owners, we generally don't interact with equine pathologists. Typically, our veterinarians deliver pathology findings on nasal swabs, biopsies, and sometimes, sadly, necropsies. But equine pathologists do so much more than examine tissue samples and cadavers. They can identify and interrupt disease outbreaks, help vets better identify and treat conditions like Wobbler syndrome, and more. Today, I'll be talking with Dr. Jennifer Janes of the University of Kentucky's Department of Veterinary Science who is based at the school's Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory here in Lexington. Welcome, Dr. Janes. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Stephanie. I'm very excited to be here and chat with you today. Well, let's um, talk a little bit about your background first. I'm curious about how you ended up as an equine pathologist. (laughs) For sure, for sure. It's definitely probably not one of the traditional routes you hear of as far as equine health and and veterinary medicine and things like that, but it is a a path nonetheless. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from Illinois. Um, I'm a Midwestern girl. Um, Again, grew up with a love of horses and things like that. Um, I did my undergrad work at uh, Vanderbilt, where of all things, I was a piano major, kind of spiced things up a little bit. Um, And then after that, I went to the University of Tennessee, um, College of Veterinary Medicine, and loved my time there, Um, really was um, had a strong equine interest. I was working in, you know, veterinary practices over the summer with an equine focus, hunter jumper farms, things like that, with the original intention of being an equine ambulatory practitioner. Um, and while I was at vet school, I also started to kind of get the interest in pathology, which is one of the core classes that you have to take in your rotations. And, and for me, what I really liked about pathology was it's kind of connecting the dots of why something's occurring, why are we seeing the lesions that we're seeing, and how we can diagnose it. And so I kind of liked that progression um, of, of flow as well. And so I was like, well, I'll just kind of keep that in the back of my mind. Um, I think one of the, the most amazing things about veterinary medicine is you can really do what you want with it over your career, um, whether you're in practice or one health and things like that. So um, it allows a lot of opportunities. Um, but staying with the equine interest, um, After I graduated from the University of Tennessee, I went up to Wisconsin Equine Clinic and Hospital. Um, It's a large referral equine clinic outside of Milwaukee um, in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. Took me a little while to be able to learn to say Oconomowoc uh, correctly. Um, (laughs) And I did a rotating um, equine um, internship. So we had about 15 veterinarians at the time, a large practice area, um, was able to enjoy a lot of time on the road and working with different, we actually had an EHV1 outbreak when I was up there that happened um, in the middle of winter and Wisconsin winters can be fierce. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. um, but while I was there, I was also kind of, you know, kind of developing an interest in musculoskeletal and still really wanting to kind of bring pathology in. Um, And so when I was kind of looking at other opportunities, I came across at the University of Kentucky, um, back at the time they had an anatomic pathology residency program as well as an opportunity to complete a PhD at the Gluck Equine Research Center. Um, So I reached out and applied for the program um, and was um, accepted into the program. And it really kind of allowed me to kind of blend everything together. My equine interests, pathology interests, and then my PhD um, ended up focusing on wobbler syndrome uh, in horses. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the the full circle of of everything. Um, And to be able to do it in central Kentucky where the equine population 
education is, you know, such a core of, of what we do here. Um, obviously, there's other important veterinary species, you know, we have the beef cattle industry, poultry industry, um, but, you know, the horse is, is quite important. And so um, I was able to complete my program and then I joined the faculty here at the University of Kentucky Veterinary Diagnostic Lab um, in 2015. Um, and I've been here ever since. And so largely my day is spent as um, a diagnostic anatomic pathologist, which I think we'll talk a little bit more later. Um, but the other thing that I really like about my position and just the nature of the area that we're in because of the concentration of the veterinarians and the Glucky Quine Research Center, there are a variety of collaborative research opportunities that we can address various aspects of equine health. And overall, my interests um, have continued both in equine musculoskeletal disease as well as neurologic disease. So um, I guess that's kind of the snapshot, um, the quick cliff notes of how I got here. <laughs> Thank you. That's really interesting. What an um, interesting circuitous path you've taken. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. I'm really, I'm really interested in seeing, I mean, so you've been there for six years and I'm interested to see the different types of things that you've been working on during that time um, at the diagnostic lab. So could you explain to our listeners the importance of pathology to equine health, please? Absolutely. Um, so I think, you know, with pathology and stuff, a lot of times we think about the shows like CSI and, and the medical examiners and, you know, there's this black light and techno music and you get a diagnosis in, you know, like <laughs> five seconds. Um, the reality of the situation is a little different, um, takes a little bit longer, um, but, but the focus is the same. So, um, like you said earlier, what we're able to do, whether we're looking at biopsies, um, so if your veterinarian takes a lump or bump off your horse and, you know, submits it to be examined, we're the ones that take a look at it to say like, oh, this is inflammatory or maybe there's some bacteria so they can do appropriate treatment or, you know, this is neoplastic, this is some type of cancer, you need to cut it off, things like that. So that's definitely a part um, of what we do. And what that allows us to do is, aid the veterinarian in, in a diagnosis um, for better treatment or management of a particular condition. Um, so either whether we're doing that from the biopsy standpoint or um, if a horse is euthanized or um, dies for some reason that it's either unknown or, you know, they want further clarification, then we can do what we call a postmortem examination um, where they submit the animal um, after the animal has died and then we can open and look at all of the tissues um, and, you know, various gastrointestinal diseases, obviously colic is a big thing in horses. Um, you know, if we're looking for infectious or inflammatory, that can be important to take back to the farm as that, is this an isolated thing or is this, you know, potentially an infectious process that we need to worry about other horses on the farm. Um, other important processes that we can um, contribute to are things um, like potential um, toxicants. So monensin, mm -hmm as we know, is um, toxic to horses. Um, it's a, a feed additive that is great for cattle, um, but if we have improperly mixed um, horse feed that has monensin in it, it's incredibly toxic to horses. Um, and so there are certain lesions that, that we can see. Um, and also we're very lucky here that we have a veterinary toxicologist, so we can work mm -hmm. um, with our toxicologist, Dr. Romano, to not only say, I see these lesions on histo, can we work up this differential? So there's a variety of ways that we can contribute to helping the submitting veterinarian or practitioners, um, you know, help, help to at least achieve a diagnosis or rule things out um, to work for either individual equine health or more of a herd health situation. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. I hadn't even thought about the toxicology side, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, you could, you guys have had have your hands on a whole lot of different things. <laughs> Probably Never very know. literally too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to give the listeners an idea of the veterinary diagnostic lab size, caseload, and function. I live just a few miles away, and I'm always curious about what's going on inside anytime I drive by by that building. Um, so, what's a typical day for you like there? Perfect. Um, absolutely. It kind of gives some framework to everything. Um, so first, I can actually just give a little description of the lab because, um, you know, depending on where you are, you may or may not have a diagnostic lab that's in close proximity to you. So a lot of times people are sending samples away. Um, 
but we're very lucky. We're actually one of two uh, state diagnostic labs in the state of Kentucky. Obviously, we're in Lexington and associated with UK. Um, our sister lab is actually the Breathitt Lab that's associated with Murray State out in western Kentucky. Um, and one of the exciting things, at least for us here at UK EDL, is that in 2011, um, we completed a almost $30 million expansion and renovation that basically resulted in doubling the, the size of the lab. And it really allows us to do our job that much better and support the constituents and the stakeholders and veterinarians um, in the area. Um, it resulted in a larger need craft C-suite, um, additional lab space, because it's not just um, pathology isn't the only section within a, a diagnostic lab, as you were talking about earlier, submitting swabs. So we have other ancillary sections. Um, so it's been really nice to, to have that space um, because it really helps us accommodate um, our caseload. So um, as I mentioned, diagnostic labs are actually made up of multiple sections that can help um, with different disease testing results and things like that. Um, pathology being one of them, but we kind of talked about we're lucky that we have a veterinary toxicologist. Um, a lot of labs don't have a boarded veterinary toxicologist, um, so we are lucky in that regard. Um, we have a microbiologist section that focuses on different bacteriology, virology testing, molecular biology, um, serology, and epidemiology. And so these are different sections that also I'll use and when I'm working up my various necropsy cases when I need to order different ancillary testing to help achieve a diagnosis. So if I need to send some tissues for culture or tissues for PCR to test for like EPM or something like that. So it's really nice to have all of that um, under one roof. So, and given the yeah. uh, kind of size of the, the equine population here, as well as actually poultry, I think one of the fun facts is like the, the number one agricultural animal in Kentucky, as far as numbers, is actually poultry. And then horses I are in last I had no idea. <laughs> So, um, so obviously the economic impact and everything with horses is huge and quite substantial. Mm -hmm. um, and most of our poultry are kind of in Western Kentucky. Um, but on average, we receive close to 300,000 test submissions per year to the lab. And so, and that's that's not just pathology, it's across all of those sections. So, so we stay uh, pretty busy um, as far as that. When we're looking particularly particularly at the pathology caseload. Um, when we look at our necropsies um, and our biopsies, so we typically receive around 3,000 necropsies per year and 3,000 biopsies per year. So that's mm -hmm. 6,000 cases um, that we divide over. Uh, currently, we have seven pathologists, so um, a little under 1,000 cases per year for each of us to work through. And if we look at our species breakdown, um, for necropsies, um, it's no surprise that equine, we're about 50, a little over 50% equine. Um, and a lot of that speaks to the industry in the area, both the thoroughbred industry, but we also have a large number of warm bloods here, um, saddlebreds, mm -hmm. things like that. And what that caseload looks like is it's everything from um, aborted fetuses, um, regardless of where, where they are in gestation, um, because it's important to achieve um, a diagnosis of, of the cause of abortion or rule things out like herpes and things like that, mm -hmm. um, all the way up to, to geriatric horses. So, um, and we receive um, horses for a variety of reasons, like I said, either diagnosis of disease or um, if there's insurance policies, things like that. So, mm -hmm. um, but we're a little over 50%. Um, after that, about 35% of our caseload is food animal. Um, and that's because Kentucky actually has the largest beef cattle population east of the Mississippi. There's a little over 1 million beef cattle here. Oh, wow. um, so, so that um, comprises that. So, but then looking at biopsy, we're kind of flipped to more companion animal um, is the majority of our caseload. Uh, we do get equine um, submissions for biopsies, um, both within the area. And I, we also get a number of um, equine biopsy submissions from out of state from equine oh. clinics that are not located in Kentucky. And I think a lot of that is just to do with the concentration of horses that we see. So, um, you know, we have veterinary clinics, you know, from New York, Illinois, Florida, that will that will send us uh, cases as well. 
<laughs> so that, um, and then as far as kind of how my day typically works, if we're talking just the pathologist, so um, if there's a necropsy submission, um, the animal will be brought to the laboratory, um, and we have a, a session form and history form for people to fill out so that we can have as much information as possible, and this is most often done by, by the veterinarian. And so that will be brought to the lab, and then we will do our postmortem examination. Um, we have a fabulous group of, of technicians that help us in this process, and you can just imagine the logistics of, of working with these large animals. And so um, based on the history and my findings, my gross findings from the floor of just looking at, at the body, um, you know, typically if there's a prelim diagnosis, we'll go ahead and send that out um, same day. The owner always gets some type of report that day to either say that we've received received and the testing is underway or that, you know, this is what I saw on gross. Mm -hmm. And then from there, we take kind of sets of tissues. And then, like I said earlier, if I need to order something for culture or things like that, I can go ahead and, and order that and go from there. And then obviously we take a set of tissues that we put in formalin. And these are the tissues that we look under the microscope that are processed to look under the microscope um, mm -hmm. and what we call the histologic examination. So once I get those back and the ancillary testing, then basically this results in a report that has my gross findings, my microscopic findings, any ancillary testing, and then a diagnosis, and then a comment if possible. And I think one of the great things about our situation is that we have such a great relationship with um, the practitioners within the area. Mm -hmm. So you know, if I have a question or if they have an additional history while we're working on the case, um, it's very much an open door policy of, of talking back and forth because obviously we want to achieve the best diagnosis we can um, for the horse. So, um, or whatever species we get, but um, but that's kind of the kind of step by step of, of, of working through a particular necropsy case. And then obviously with the biopsy case, those tissues come in fixed already, um, typically, and so we'll just look at those, and those will have a, a ra more rapid turnaround time um, to get back okay. to, to the practitioner. So okay, it sounds like no day is exactly the same. Exactly, which is what I like. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. And I think the listeners just need to know how many veterinarians are around here. There's so many equine veterinarians. It's a giant community. Everybody knows everybody. Um, and it's great to hear that you guys are working together across the different types of veterinary professions, too. Absolutely. It's, it's one of the things I enjoy most about this area, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So um, many of us remember seeing pathology samples in jars back in biology class, things like fetal pigs, <laughs> bovine eyes, et cetera, et cetera. Could you tell us a little bit about your libraries that you have and what they make possible with research? Absolutely. So um, one of the benefits of, of our area and being here in, in central Kentucky is, is the high caseload. And so that allows us to develop these extensive archives of um, tissues. And typically when I say this, I mean the tissues that we have processed for um, microscopic exam. Um, so we keep those in what we call paraffin embedded blocks. And so we have, you know, decades of, of archived tissues from cases over the years. And so, um, you know, if you're talking about something like, um, you know, MRLS or things like that, you know, we have the tissues from, from unfortunately, MRLS that we hope never happens again, but um, also other processes. So um, things like necardioform placentitis, the type of bacterial placentitis um, that we see. And so what that allows us to do is kind of look at these diseases over time. So if we start to see kind of a, a change or, um, you know, we can go back and look at the archive tissues and be like, is this is this potential pathogen presenting differently? Or, you know, is there maybe another pathogen there previously that we didn't discover until more recently? And so we can go back and be like, oh, this was actually here five, six, seven years ago. And now we have the diagnostic methods to test for it. So um, it's, it's a really great source of material, not only from a diagnostic standpoint, but from various collaborative research standpoints um, to look at different disease processes and then also just to have the sheer numbers um, allows for more robust like retrospective analyses of, of different diseases because you know we have on the thousands to tens of thousands of, of cases within our archives. So um, for the listener who might not be familiar with the MRLS that was Mare Reproductive Loss Syndrome I believe it was 2001 I, I think, think so, is when yeah. it luckily before maybe, my time. 
<laughs> yes. Well, it wasn't before my time. I remember we were reporting on it. And, and I mean, even in that situation, there was, I can remember the researchers working with the clinicians who were treating the horses or finding the aborted foals and things like that, or finding the losses. Could you maybe in a nutshell explain what mere reproductive loss syndrome was and kind of what that ended up being so that the person who wasn't around then maybe could learn a little? Yep. So it was um, basically an unfortunate um, time where uh, there was just this massive both kind of early fetal loss and late um, fetal loss um, that basically resulted in just a, a massive hit to the industry um, from the number of, of foals that, that were lost in that crop um, and just had, you know, everybody um, scratching their heads. And so um, it was a situation where the, the practitioners and um, the researchers and then obviously all of these um, uh, cases were being submitted to the diagnostic lab for a postmortem exam to try and, you know, rule things out. And so through that whole collaboration and that time, they were able to isolate some particular um, bacteria and, um, you know, potentially the role of the, the uh, caterpillar and things like that and be able to kind of bring it all together. So it was a very scary time um, because when you have a loss that, that is that massive um, and just trying to figure out, you know, what are we ruling in? What are we ruling out? Um, you know, I know at the lab from the pathologist before me, you know, it was talking about getting, you know, 30, 35, 50 cases per day just related to to that, mm -hmm. that loss. And so um, just trying to work through that and have the resources. So it was definitely one of those where it took everybody involved to to get it figured out. Mm -hmm. And ultimately ended up being what the consumption of accidental consumption of Eastern tent caterpillars. And it was like the little hairs that are on the caterpillars. Oh, yeah. That's a that mm -hmm. allow for they the did something. Uh, OK, so they did something to the GI tract of the mare, right? And then ended up going into the bloodstream. OK, yep. something like that. OK, <laughs> this, is the this is the journalist's perspective versus the pathologist's perspective here. Um, so that was an interesting, almost like a CSI type thing mm -hmm. uh, back in 2001 of everybody just trying to step in. And if there was something that they could stop, if there's some okay. exposure that they could stop, OK, well, is it the caterpillars? Or then we need to keep the mares off the field. Yep. Is it the... Is it the, I think there was a cherry tree. Um, yeah. yeah, someone thought it might have been cherry trees at one point. So it was just basically a moving target. So um, thankfully we've not seen any more of that except in little spurts here and there, right? Yeah, yeah we just see it sporadically, um, but nothing to the level of, of what was seen back in the early 2000s, which is good. Thankfully, <laughs> yes, indeed. So have you had any discoveries in your day-to-day -day activities that you found surprising or fascinating? For sure. Um, I think, you know, like I said before, you know, since we do see such a high um, equine caseload, you know, you definitely get used to different um, disease processes and even kind of like the seasonality of things so you know more in kind of the spring summer you know we see more rotococcus um you know and then you know kind of move into like potomac horse fever lawsonia is kind of over you know winter a little bit and so you do get used to this you know seasonality it's almost like i don't have to look at the calendar i can just be like oh we're seeing these diseases now um so you kind of get used to the routine of how these diseases present um but sometimes i think the extent and severity. So for um, some of the rotococcus cases, you know, obviously it, it can cause this devastating pneumonia um, in foals, but it can also cause lesions outside of the respiratory system. So we can get these huge masses, pyogranulomas, um, and the abdomen that's affecting the lymph nodes. And I think just the severity and extent that these can go to, or sometimes they can go up to the spine and cause um, uh, what we call an osteomyelitis, but um, basically a bacterial mm. inflammatory infection within the bone itself. So um, these foals, you also have a subset that will present neurologic um, because they'll actually have an osteomyelitis within their, their spinal column. Um, I think some of the developmental malformations um, can be interesting. I've had definitely a couple of kind of funky head sinus things um, that, that have presented. And so you just kind of, you're like, well, oh, the body is a very uh, interesting, interesting thing for sure. So I think the variation kind of, you know, when you think you've seen it all, then, you know, obviously pathogens and disease processes 
you know, evolve, adapt, and things like that. And so, um, you know, you can start to see a variation um, on a theme for sure. No, that's really interesting. So is it the time of course fever season right now or? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> how, how has our year been so far for that? Um, so far, um, I think we've been pretty quiet, which is good because that means they're treating them in the field. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, that's good. So, yeah. So that's it's always good when we don't see them. So and that's how we prefer it's, it. <laughs> yes. Yes, so, indeed. Um, but yeah, indeed. at least as far as the, the postmortem floor. Yeah. And what's a 30,000 foot view on what Potomac horse fever is for the person who might not be familiar with that? I know it has a complicated life cycle. We don't have to get into it too deep, but just so they know what we're talking about. <laughs> right. Um, so Potomac horse fever, um, it's caused by an organism that we call Neorickettsia uh, ristici. Um, originally, it was kind of a, a sporadic disease, but um, you know we are starting to see it in various locations within like the U.S. and Canada, and we typically see it in late spring, um, early fall. And so um, these horses will present with anything from fever to diarrhea, laminitis, colic. Um, and so definitely, you know, supportive care is is really important. So, you know, definitely it's on your list for colitis and and, and laminitis. Um, mortality rates can vary um, anywhere from like 10 to, to 30%, things like that. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that it can result in abortion. Um, so we have had a few cases, um, and I believe it's typically within um, four to five months of, um, of when they were, um, the mares were sick. And so um, I have had a couple of cases actually where in the history, um, the practitioners will say that, you know, the mare was treated for Potomac horse fever a few months ago. Um, and we actually have a, a PCR test that we can run for the fetus um, for Potomac horse fever. And so it is definitely not a um, large uh, cause for our um, equine abortions, but you know, I've definitely over the years I've had a couple of cases, so um, it's definitely important where the that information and communication with the the practitioner is important because I think we definitely always think about the mare, um, which is or you know if, or the adult horse that's affected, um, which is important. Um, but definitely in our mares, it's it's something to to keep in mind. And like I said, it's a very small small portion. Um, but again, it's the ability to to give an answer and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. And it's it's important to say that you know because I'm of course fever, equine herpes virus, any of these diseases could have like an entire podcast devoted just to them because <laughs> they're just so complex and interesting. So, let's talk about a syndrome that you have worked with called Wobbler syndrome. We've reported on some of your past research on this interesting um, condition. What is it and in what horses do you see it most? Perfect. Um, so Wobblers in general, um, if I'm talking with people and I hope that um, people do not have an experience with Wobblers, but unfortunately it is one of the more um, common neurologic musculoskeletal diseases that we see. Um, so I think that the thing that to keep in mind about wobblers is basically there is some malformation or change in the cervical vertebrae, the neck vertebrae themselves that result in a narrowing of that spinal canal and the spinal cord gets compressed. Um, so while these horses present with neurologic deficits due to that spinal cord compression, the underlying problem is actually a musculoskeletal problem. It's those malformations, those changes um, mm -hmm. within the vertebrae themselves. And so we've kind of gotten to the point of thinking of it in, in two groups. Um, so we have kind of our younger um, horses um, development age as far as, um, you know, we think of like the two to three to four year olds as far as thoroughbreds, um, warm bloods more five to six years of age. And that's because as far as this developmental aspect, the growth plates in the neck actually don't close until four to six years of age in horses, depending on the breed. So we still have this kind of development and maturation of the vertebrae themselves. And so that's kind of our younger group um, that we see it in. And then now we're starting to see it um, in our older group of horses, um, or older to 
middle-aged horses that have significant osteoarthritis of a particular joint in the neck. It's called the articular process joint. Um, and it's just, it's a synovial joint, just like your knee joint and things like that. So a lot of times you'll hear of treatments to inject those articular process joints. So if you, they can have significant osteoarthritis that actually also can result in compression um, of the cords. So we kind of have these two populations of, of horses. Um, as far as more commonly affected breeds. Um, there's been several multi-center studies looking at, you know, hospital submissions and things like that. And um, thoroughbreds are commonly reported, warm bloods, quarter horses, walking horses. Um, any breed can be affected, but those are the ones that we tend to see uh, more commonly. And one of the other important things about wobblers is the gender ratio. So um, we see it much more common in males versus um, females. Um, we do see it in fillies, um, just not as common as um, stallions or geldings. And when you look in the literature, that gender ratio is very well documented, anywhere from like three to one up to 11 to one of males versus mm -hmm. um, females. And the interesting thing about the fillies that are affected is typically they tend to be kind of larger in size than their age match pasture mates. Um, and that's related to some of the, the growth and uh, aspects that we think, you know, results in this kind of imbalance in, in the bone maturation um, as mm -hmm. these, um, as they're growing so quickly. And so the interesting thing was we actually plotted um, age of admission, um, looking through root and riddles um, case population a few years ago, we looked over a span of 10 years and we saw these two peaks. One was um, around like six to 12 months of age and then another was around, you know, 24, 36 months of age. And it's interesting because those correspond to the two major growth periods um, with, within the horse, so around six months of age and then the second um, around puberty. And so mm -hmm. again, kind of speaking to the multifactorial nature um, of this disease, um, there's also um, the role of um, uh, copper and zinc, which are trace minerals important for collagen and things like that. This long-standing question about is there a genetic contribution? And so um, it's definitely a very complex disease and, you know, typically we'll say multifactorial. And so, um, you know, so as far as the different treatment options, you know, it really has to be on a case-by-case a -case basis. And I definitely leave that to my, my practitioner colleagues. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of describe when you're working up a wobbler case or you are um, studying a wobbler case, how does that information come to you? Do you receive an MRI? Do you get clin clinical information from the veterinarian? Uh, tell me a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, so I think one of the exciting things about wobblers, um, I guess if you can say there's something exciting about it, is that recently we've had great advances in diagnostic imaging for horses. Um, you know, obviously the size of the horse um, can make some of those imaging modalities that we're used to either in our small animals or on the human side, like CT and MRI. Um, it's it's great in the small animal and, and human world, but the size of the horse, you know, it, it's a little different. So, um, you know, five, six years ago when we were doing our wobblers research, we were doing MRIs on these horses, I'll bet post-mortem because the size we couldn't do clinical um, MRIs, um, but that helped us kind of understand um, the pathology and the lesions that we were seeing in the vertebral column because we could now look at the neck in multiple planes, whereas like with radiography, you're just looking from like the lateral aspects mainly. And so that was really great, but then it's like, well, we still can't do an MRI of the neck. We can do MRI of the limbs um, and, and horses, um, but now large bore CT units, um, which are, kind of popping up at our veterinary schools, referral and tertiary clinics, um, these large board clinical CT units, you can actually do a CT myelogram of a horse. And so a myelogram is one of those important imaging modalities to help clinically um, diagnose these diseases by seeing where the spinal cord compression is. And so the fact that we now have a CT where we can look at the neck in multiple planes, and so that really helps us to give an even better picture of what might be causing the, the compression or the malformation. And so, you know, for me as a pathologist, having as much imaging information prior um, is important because it helps direct how I'm going to do my postmortem exam to make sure that we maximize identifying the lesions and things like that. So to me, having that information is incredibly beneficial um, from the practitioner, whether 
they shot radiographs or if they did a myelogram or if they did a CT myelogram, whatever information they were able to gather, their neurologic exam definitely helps me um, you know, with my exam, and the better that we can identify and describe the different pathologies um, helps to have us a better understanding of, of the disease itself. So it's definitely a nice way to work back and forth. Mm -hmm. So then the veterinarian essentially has more information in their mind on when they have additional yeah. cases come in. And then do you take this information and store it for future research? Do you have any current studies that are happening with that? So it's nice because, you know, because we have our archived reports and things like that. So then we can start to look at are there, you know, certain locations that are more commonly affected in, in potential breeds. You know, I think we're starting to look at the caudal neck more and more. Um, if you think that's like the area, it's almost like I described kind of like the fulcrum. If you think as the horse is grazing and moving its head up and down. And so, you know, seeing more significant cervical osteoarthritis back. Um, in the caudal neck. And so um, that's where kind of, you know, being able to more um, describe these different lesions and the context of age and signalment um, becomes important for, you know, understanding the um, syndrome and, you know, what treatment makes sense or, or doesn't make sense and things like that. And so I think just continuing to work with the synergy of the imaging modalities and then the postmortem exam um, to provide more information is, is where we are. Okay, thank you. As an equine innovator, how do you foresee equine pathology changing and or shaping the future of horse health? So I think um, as I've kind of said before and kind of how diagnostic, diagnostic pathologists fit within the entire scheme of, of veterinary medicine is, you know, continuing to be that kind of part of the pie as far as, you know, whether helping to, um, achieve a diagnosis or, you know, looking at a particular disease entity more thoroughly to say, you know, we're seeing a particular change in, in lesions and things like that. And what does that mean about this overall disease process? Um, I think the other thing, just by the nature of where we are and the number of equine submissions that we get, um, since we're kind of a, a central area. So if you think one farm is having an issue, maybe another farm is having an issue, but if they're both submitting to us, then sometimes we can be kind of the first people to be like, you know, we're seeing an uptick in this, you know, necardioform placentitis or, or something like that and get that information out to the practitioners to be like, you know, we need to, to keep a pulse on this. So um, just because of our, our location and that we receive submissions from, from so many practitioners and farmers in the area, if there is kind of a more general issue that may be going on, um, you know, we are in the, the place and potential to be the first ones to, to see it and then, you know, to be like, okay, guys, we might be having an issue, you know, let's talk, you know, is this something that's occurring or if we all talk and we can reel it out to something else, be like, nope, it's fine. And so, um, so I think that's something that's unique and, um, and good about our particular area and how we can contribute to, to overall equine health for sure. Thank you very much, Dr. James, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Thank you, Stephanie. It was really great to be here with you guys. I really enjoyed it. And thank you to all the listeners as well. Yeah, thanks guys for joining us. I also want to thank our sponsor, Zoetis. For more from the horse, visit thehorse.com, sign up for our newsletters, or look for Ask the Horse Live wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Please join us next time as we explore the horse industry equine innovators.